Alright, hi everyone, David Parsons here. Welcome to Nostalgia Trap. This is another entry in our ongoing series we call Housing Trap, in which our good friend Andrew Schustek talks about housing in New York City and the wider world with some of the foremost writers from the left side of the political spectrum, I would say, uh, on the housing problem and how we approach it. I have learned a lot from these episodes. This is like a an, a real education, I think, in what's really going on with housing, uh, both in New York City and beyond. If you want to check out all of these episodes, they're collected on our Patreon page. I've, I'll put a link in the episode description. Uh, but this episode is a discussion with um, our friend Samuel Stein, who's written a piece in the New York Review of Architecture called The Social Housing Question. It's out right now. And this is sort of like the magnum opus uh, of Sam's housing work, in which he is sort of trying to put together a lot of the theoretical and practical issues uh, and contradictions, which you know you know we love contradictions on Nostalgia Trap, uh, of a sort of left approach uh, or a social approach to affordable housing. So if you want to go check that out, I'll have a, a link to that article. Um, you should read it. It's a good back, background for this interview. Uh, but I think they hit a lot of the highlights in this conversation. But either way, they, the New York Review of Architecture was nice enough to offer us a discount code for Nostalgia Trap listeners. Uh, so if you want to go to uh, that link, I'll put that in the episode description as well. The discount code is AFFORDABLE. If you put that in, you'll get a 25% discount on a subscription. They are well worth your support uh, because they are doing a lot of work on housing that's, I think, um, pushing the conversation to places that it doesn't usually go. Uh, and that includes this conversation uh, with Andrew and Sam. So I hope you enjoy this. Go check out all the links in the episode description for more uh, housing education from us and from the New York Review of Architecture. Thanks for being a Nostalgia Trap listener. Here's Andrew Schustek talking with Samuel Stein. Sam, welcome back to the Nostalgia Trap. Thanks, Andrew. Um, as David had introduced, we are, uh, are, are blessed to be able to talk about your latest piece for the New York Review of Architecture, um, who was... Uh, very kindly giving us a discount code for listeners of this episode. Um, check out the discount code that David had said at the beginning of this episode. Let's really make sure that um, as many of you can read some Sam Stein as possible. Um, I've been able to um, fortunately be published in the New York Review of Architecture. Nostalgia Trap favorite Yasmin Nair is in this latest issue. Of course, bringing her take on... Um, an exhibition about wood framed homes and, and, and asking what does Harrison Ford have to do with it in only the way that Yasmin can. Um, Sam, we're here to discuss your social housing question piece, which uh, as, as someone who's read a lot of your work, I, it is certainly the longest, certainly your most complete. Um, and I, I think there's just an ambivalent um, acid tone here, as David and Justin have been sort of talking about, um, that I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, there's there's a lot to get into in the article. I probably could have written twice as much on the subject. Um, and it, it's called The Social Housing Question, which is a reference to the famous Engels pamphlet called The Housing Question. But there's just a lot of questions that arise when you um, start to look at how could a country like America actually do social housing or more specifically, how could a city and state like New York do social housing? It's it's an easy answer for us to give um, to the problems with the housing system now. But once you sort of like start to get into what it would take to do it and do it well and not just repeat the things that haven't worked in the past, a lot of unanswered questions that come up. And, and before we get into the specifics around the piece, um, because you're tackling the question in New York specifically, I wanted to, to get in some of the latest reporting by David Brand in Gothamist, um, taking on his analysis just put out by the state comptroller, to quote David, um, the, house of, the price of renting or owning a home in the five boroughs and the surrounding counties of New York 
jumped by about 68% between 2012 and 2022, a bigger spike than any other major metropolitan area in the U.S. In 2012, the average household in New York and Nassau, Suffolk, Rockland, and Westchester County spent about 18 k housing, including rent, mortgage payments, property taxes, etc. That amount rose to $30,000 by 20, to, uh, 2022, um, which now make housing costs uh, about 40% of average household expenses for New Yorkers in the region, uh, compared to about 34% nationwide. That would make everybody um, rent burdened by definition, uh, spending at least 30% of your income on housing. Most people, yeah. So we did an analysis of the most recent data from New York City, which found that most renters are rent burdened. Uh, most renters live in unaffordable housing. And it kind of like um, challenges the meaning of what's normal anymore. 30% um, is the, the standard that the federal government uses for what's affordable housing. Even that is inflated. At one point, it was 20%, then it was 25%, now it's 30 But if most New Yorkers are paying more than 30% in rent, they could very easily say, well, 35 is the new standard. Um, but either way, it just gets to be more and more and more. Um, those 10 years were particularly brutal. Um, but if we looked at a, a long trend line, we'd see that, that line rising for decades now. Right. It you know, the confluence of factors over the last 10 years, specifically pandemic, um, and then and then the absolute just sort of erosion of any sort of social cohesion following that, it feels like the last few years specifically, things have just increased uh, in the overall inflation numbers. And, um, you know, you look at the statistics nationally and how people are feeling about the economy, the way that people feel and interpret um, the economy is much worse than even the the shitty data that 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 they're seeing and feeling. Uh, to summarize that, we have a a pretty resilient, uh, oddly resilient economy here in the U.S., but people are not feeling that way. Yeah, and and there's a lot of reasons for that, but housing is definitely a big one. That if the price of various goods goes down, but you still lose all the money that you make to your landlord or to the bank. Uh, then it just doesn't feel like you're you're doing all right in this economy. Um, and and so it's unsustainable for democratic politicians to think that they can intervene in all sorts of other aspects of people's uh, income and, and costs, but let housing costs escalate to the point that they have where it's 40% of most people's uh, income in New York City. Um, as we've discussed on this show specifically, um, the supply question is always being brought up. Sam, maybe um, you could give us a sort of quick review of the last year of the the state's attempts to, you know, bolster affordability uh, using more or, or trying to use more housing construction, when, which went absolutely nowhere. Um, and then I think that's a sort of nice jumping off point into into the sort of questions that you pose around social housing in New York. Yeah, um, you know. Part of the, the popularity of social housing, part of the reason why people like me and others are, are trying to push a social housing agenda is to have another way of talking about supply. Um, when the governor of New York talks about housing supply, the president of the United States, the mayor, um, they often talk about how much housing we're building, but they don't actually mean that. They, much, they mean how much housing we're allowing developers to build. Uh, and they're mostly talking about land use and specifically zoning. Um, the article that you mentioned at the beginning, which is a very good article by a very good journalist, talks about how the state controller frames that dramatic rise in rent and rent burden in New York City. Um, and it's framed entirely around this question of construction and housing supply. The theory being um, costs are not rising, costs are rising because there's not enough construction. Um, right. Well, costs, costs rising in the passive sense that language, as we've discussed in the shows, is is fascinating the way that rents just keep rising as if, uh, you know, some some force is just some invisible force is just is just guiding them along. The the rent is the actor in the sentence. <laughs> I as believe Justin would, would would I believe Justin would have a few things to say as an English professor. Sure, sure. Um, lo looking at that article, though, I, I thought like 
okay, I should actually look at the numbers before uh, doing this interview because we had talked about that article. And so it, it's talking about the years 2012 to 2022. Uh, we have better data for 2011 to 2021 for boring reasons I don't need to get into. But if you look at that time, um, you can calculate how much did the population of New York City grow? How much did the housing stock grow? Um, and basically, in those 10 years, the population of the city uh, grew by 121,000. And the housing construction... So if you look at the statistics about growth in New York City, you do see the population growing. You also see the number of housing units growing. Uh, they've actually roughly grown apace with one another. So that... Um, the number of housing units we're adding is roughly the right number for the number of people we're adding uh, given a average family size about two and a half. So you can make the, the argument that we need more housing, but it's not like we're not adding housing, uh, but we're adding housing mostly to the top of the market, the most expensive stuff, uh, and it's not resolving the affordability crisis. Last so year... Uh, the, the governor of New York State made housing unaffordability a central issue, and that should have been a great thing. Uh, but she didn't want to spend more money on housing, and she didn't want to regulate it anymore. Uh, what she wanted to do was mandate that um, New York State localities change their zoning to allow for more development. Uh, basically, you had to show that you were growing by a certain amount or else the state could override your local zoning to allow a project to get built. Um, this could have been something that a lot of different types of people could have supported, but she is remarkably unskilled at politics. And I don't understand why, uh, but she did not get the support of the unions that could have supported this. She did not get the support of renters in the suburbs who want more housing options, who are tired of living in their parents' basement. She didn't do any of that kind of organizing. And so she got attacked from every side, from uh, suburbanites who didn't want apartment buildings in their areas, uh, from city dwellers who were saying, well, we're building and it's still unaffordable. And what we really need is uh, stronger rent protections or truly affordable housing or something like that. And so she had a coalition of nobody basically except uh, some of the yes in my backyard Yimby pro-development crowd, which was not nearly enough to carry her agenda over, uh, over the line. And so basically nothing important on housing passed, not the zoning stuff, but also not the tenant protections, not building any more uh, publicly subsidized housing, nothing. And so we have the situation where housing gets worse and worse and worse for more people, um, the government is seemingly unable to uh, find its own um, consensus on what to do. And this led to a pretty remarkable exchange just recently with the governor and the Nassau County executive, Bruce Blakeman, in which Bruce Blakeman accused the governor of essentially going to war with Long Island by just encouraging some sort of housing development on the, on the, on that island. It really um, just goes to show you how the constituencies in the suburbs really do not have an appetite to, to do the development, which really sort of gets lost in the, in the big question of like, okay, where do we, where do we build this housing? Where, where, you know, and uh, I think what's frustrating for a lot of folks is that, you know, when they see New York, um, they see a crowded, um, over, over overdeveloped um, urban landscape. You look at Long Island. They ask, "Why can't we build a Long Long Island Railroad?" And and the, and the answer is because they don't want it. Yeah, they don't want it. Uh, they have the local power to stop it, and the governor doesn't have the political skills to override it. And it seems like the National Democrats really don't want her to push that agenda again this year. And so she's not. But basically, they're afraid that uh, Democrats running for Congress would have to take a stand either for or against new housing construction. And uh, either way is kind of a losing issue. So 
uh, they're just not pushing housing in a in a serious way. Especially now, just given the 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 election coming up, I think that's what we're sort of getting at here is that in such a contentious um, atmosphere, and given that the margins uh, that Democrats are facing in New York are are razor thin in some cases. I mean, this governor, let's not forget. Um, nearly lost to Lee Zeldin. I mean, uh, only a five point victory over one of the most extreme Republicans in the country. Um, it, it is just kind of a remarkable situation. And so housing will continue to be left to the private sector. Um, and, and this is, I think, where you come in and your piece on the social housing question on the New York Review of Architecture. Sam, maybe um, summarize what social housing is and uh, what is the social housing question? Yeah, social housing can be a very broad term, um, and that's a strength and a weakness. Like a lot of different people mean a lot of different things by it in different parts of the world and at different times it has meant different things. Um, so some of the work that me and my coworker Oksana Miranova and others have been trying to do is to provide a workable definition. Um, we do think that it makes sense to have it be a big tent that incorporates a lot of different specific housing models, but for it to have like specific features that make housing social versus antisocial. And you might think of that as a spectrum uh, from the most unregulated, profit-oriented housing being the most antisocial to um, this other extreme. So the features that make housing social housing are that it's decommodified, that uh, residents have control, and that it has various aspects of social equality. So decommodification means that it's not bought and sold on the open market, either by the people who live in it or by the landlord class. Uh, and that's a permanent feature. It's not that it's decommodified for a certain amount of time and then it becomes commodified. In the, in the ideal form, it is permanently decommodified housing. Resident control can look different in different models, but it basically means uh, it's not just managed by whoever owns it, which might be a government authority, um, whoever lives there has a say over uh, the day-to-day -day operations of it. Um, and, you know, you might think of it as like the fight for workplace democracy. Uh, on the one hand, you want the fight for, for residential democracy on the other. So it could be a cooperative housing model where um, everybody who lives there co-owns the place, but agrees uh, not to increase the value of the resale. Um, that would be one form of resident democracy. Those owners could sort of manage the place themselves. They could also elect to hire a manager. But if they didn't like that manager, they could fire them and hire somebody else. But it's under the control of the residents. In a rental situation, it's maybe a little bit more complex. But the renters um, could have either a controlling share of the board of the owning entity, which is how something called a mutual housing association works. It's a nonprofit that owns rental housing, but the tenants of the housing are on the board of the nonprofit. So it, they're not they're not alienated from it in the same way that other renters would be, or the renters could have a renters association that has like formal bargaining rights with whatever entity owns the building, a government uh, authority, union, a nonprofit, whoever it is, they have to bargain with the tenants to do things like uh, change the rent or um, decide on a garbage policy or whatever it is. So that's resident control. The third feature is social equality, which has a couple different dimensions. One is equality within the building. So let's say that it's a mixed income building. There's some people who make uh, a fair amount of money and some people who make no money whatsoever. They should be treated the same. Um, they, it's not like, you know, if there is an amenity in the building, like a collective kitchen or a gym or something, it's only available to the wealthier tenants. Uh, everybody gets the same. It's also not like the people who pay more live on top and have the good view and the people who don't live in the basement. It has to be mixed up. But also it's a quality or like horizontally so that the, the social housing isn't um, distinct in a bad way from everything that surrounds it. It's not stigmatized. It's not underfunded. It's not like this one building um, that, you know, looks worse than all the others on the block. It's roughly equal. So again, those three dimensions are um, decommodification, resident control, social equality. Different housing models within social housing might be better on one of those fronts than another. 
but to qualify as social housing, it has to have some significant aspect of all three. And and what's so interesting about the piece is, you know, for one, you use your own apartment as uh, a framing device uh, throughout the piece. And, and you, you live in Hell's Kitchen in a building that looks very much like any other building, but it is, in fact, um, in the rubric of social housing. Yeah, you, you'd never know from the outside that my building is any different than the pretty expensive rental buildings or the, the condo buildings. Uh, it, it fits in. And the reason that it fits in is this is a conversion model of social housing. So you can have construction models where you build it from the ground up, or you can have conversion models where you take anti-social housing and you turn it into social housing. In my case, the landlord who owned uh, eight adjacent buildings on my block uh, stopped paying their taxes and the city took them took possession of the buildings in 1979. Um, they hired some of the people who lived here and also some other folks to fix up the apartments, which the landlord had neglected for a very long time. And then they sold it back to the tenants under the condition that they would pay very little money to buy it. They could sell it uh, for not much more than they paid it for. And when they sell it, they have to sell it to people under a certain income. level. So basically people in the same class position as them. This was 1979 to 1981, so we're talking more than 40 years ago, uh, and it's still much cheaper than everything that surrounds it. Um, decent quality, you know, it's an old tenement. It it has the the pros and cons of that. It's it's one long railroad apartment with windows only on two sides. You can't really change that, um, but it's held up a lot better than the ones that landlords have continued to milk and exploit for rent money. For the last 40 years um well one of the big questions uh that uh, a listener might have after reading your piece is uh whether or not your building was decommodified because the landlord attempted to kill a neighbor <laughs> and burn down the house um one of the, the this does bring up a, a really interesting sort of contradiction of social housing in in america and and something that you thread throughout the piece quite nicely is that Every building has its own context and conditions and political uh, economy of whether or not that piece of housing was socialized or, or in the in the reverse case. And as, as we know, hundreds of thousands of units uh, were, were taken off of regulation and put into a more private market. Um, and thanks to uh, insidious laws like the Erstat law around the state, we can't do anything about that. Um, but I think one of the interesting things about your piece is just how much you thread um, the long history of social housing. And I think to to folks who just don't have this vocabulary, um, whether you know physical or visual in the in their in their toolkit, you know some of this stuff can can seem almost impossible or unrealistic. Um, you know. Speaking uh, for a cousin who literally did not believe that uh, the 20s and 30s, sort of these models had, had been existing in, in New York City for a long time. Um, you cite here that just under 9% of New York City's social uh, housing, of New York City's housing stock is social housing, uh, and 91% is not compared with other U.S. cities. That's a lot compared with cities known for their social housing, like Singapore or Vienna. It is not. So you take a real global approach here. Maybe you could talk about the, the New York City social housing scene in the context of, uh, uh, of the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, New York started uh, building social housing or people in New York started building social housing in the 1920s. Um, and they were inspired by things that were happening in other parts of the world, especially in Red Vienna, um, which was the democratic socialist um government of vienna austria in the late teens early 20s or all of the 20s um which was building social housing at a mass scale and making it really um a large part of their like demonstration of their political ideals uh and it was very public demonstration so in that red vienna model the most famous uh housing complex called karl Marxhof. And it's a gigantic, it's the longest vertical building um, in the world, or at least it was at the time. I'm, I'm sure Dubai has uh, has them beat now. But it, 
is a very long um, set of buildings that basically has streets carved into it. Uh, and it has a gorgeous interior courtyard and playgrounds and libraries and kindergartens and all sorts of social architecture. You have to walk through it in order to get to the main soccer stadium. So this was great propaganda for, for the government, uh, showing that they could build this beautiful social housing and, and have everyone walk right through it. It's not off limits or anything like that. And then everybody wanted it. Everybody wanted to have their own, you know, Karl Marxhoff flat. Um, and they would go about building tons and tons of it. At this point, uh, a, a majority of Vienna's housing is social housing. We never quite did that in New York, but there were people who were looking to Vienna and looking to other uh, socialist cities and trying to replicate the model. Uh, as you, Andrew, and our friend Avi wrote about uh, in the Bronx, there was a whole proliferation of these worker-built cooperatives, um, often built by kind of rival left factions in an interesting way, all within adjacent neighborhoods, but you had... Rival uh, left factions? You don't Yes, say. unheard of, right? But this was like the good kind of rival left where they were each building their own utopian society and not going to war with each other for the most part. Uh, but you had you had the the communist coups that uh, you and Avi wrote about in Jewish Currents a couple of years ago. Um, you had the amalgamated dwellings, which was built by the United Housing Foundation, which was a spinoff of the garment workers um, under the control of basically social Democrats. Um, there was socialists, there were uh, Yiddishites, there were all these different kinds of left-wing groups, each building their own social housing in the Bronx. Um, eventually about 40,000, I believe, apartments would be built by uh, unions and affiliated organizations around the city. Um, just a, about a decade after that stuff starts, we get the construction of public housing in New York City, which is some of the first in the country. Uh, Milwaukee was doing kind of similar things parallel, um, but we built first houses, which was public housing built by New York City before the federal government got involved in public housing. Um, that was kind of meant to look like the housing that surrounded it. The initial idea was that it was actually gonna be conversions. They were gonna buy uh, existing housing, I think from the Astor family and convert tenements into public housing. That turned out to be too costly, and so they knocked it down and, and built and replaced. But what they built and replaced looks more or less like everything else on the block. So again, going with that social equality of not stigmatizing this public housing, but making it fit in with the, with the kind of urban fabric. A um, couple decades after that, New York State starts building publicly subsidized rentals and uh, cooperatives, cooperatives that are meant to be affordable in the long run. Um, over time, a lot of those rentals become private market and are now uh, very expensive, which sucks. But almost all of the co-ops remained uh, affordable, though a few in gentrifying neighborhoods flipped. Um, and then we get to the era of my housing, uh, a time when there was a large amount of landlord abandonment of the housing stock and tenants fighting uh, to preserve their housing as social housing. And so you get conversion. So you get uh, the kind of thing that I live in, it's called the Housing Development Fund Corporation. You also have community land trusts being formed in the Lower East Side, which decommodify land and then have the buildings on top of them owned either by the tenants themselves with a long-term affordability contract or by those mutual housing associations I was talking about before, which is a rental where the, the tenants are basically also the board of the nonprofit. So they don't individually own the, the apartments, but they uh, control the nonprofit entity that does. So over about 100 years, we have the construction of a lot of affordable social housing and the conversion of a lot of affordable social housing. Um, but it peaks at about 9% of the housing stock. Uh, in cities like Singapore, like Vienna, we're talking about more like 80% of the housing stock. We have a long way to go, but there's really nothing else in this country that uh, comes close to 9%. So New York is both ahead and behind the curve. And, you know, it's interesting thinking about the context of social housing in um, cities that, um, you know, at one time dabbled with more egalitarian uh, 
political formations, um, specifically Vienna. Um, but in, in the contemporary context, which is what I think your piece does really well, one of the central questions we're trying to get at here is like, how do we think about social housing in a world that is increasingly hostile to it? Um, you know, it's it's the central contradiction of <laughs> doing something that's decommodified within uh, a capitalist system. You know, you think about Singapore, for example, it is also one of the most uh, uneven uh, in terms of distribution of wealth cities on Earth. Um, it has some of the ultra, ultra, ultra elite on the Eastern Hemisphere who um, are often paying $40,000 just for the right to have a car. That is how much money some of these folks have. But at the same time, this social housing sort of exists within that context. So it's it's all about how do we think about models and apply them here? And I think what your, your piece has a really um, ambivalent tone about, which I think I appreciate so much is, you know, the answers are, 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 are not very easy to come by. Yeah. Yeah. There's no easy answer for sure. Uh, like you said, decommodifying housing in, in a hyper-capitalist society, but especially one that has placed so much value on rising housing costs, um, uh, is going to be pretty difficult. It's going to be difficult to build the political will. Um, it's going to be difficult to sustain the political will, even if we were to win that program once. Um, it's going to take some cultural shifts in what people expect out of their housing. Um, though in some ways the market is kind of taking care of that. If people no longer think of uh, for-profit home ownership as an option, then alternatives start looking a lot better. Um, and then there's all these kind of thorny geographical questions and political questions about who exactly would do the building of the new social housing. Where would it go? How do we think about things like climate change? How do we not repeat the, hor the, the horrible practices of urban renewal in the middle of the 20th century, where we cleared away just as much poor people's housing as we ever built, in a lot of cases, a lot less? Um, and, you know, other periods of social housing development in New York had going for them either the availability of a lot of land that could be urbanized, like in the Bronx in the 20s, um, an urban renewal program, which is bad, but which created open space, um, or a climate of landlord abandonment. So that, that produces opportunities, too, if the landlords are walking away from housing. We don't really have any of those things. Uh, New York City is fairly well built up. So like you asked before, that could, you know, raise the possibility of building this stuff in the suburbs. But also, like we talked about before, the suburbs are fairly militantly hostile against even for-profit apartment construction, let alone uh, mass social housing. So it's all it's all pretty daunting. It, and, and, you know, to, to layer on top another challenge is is the legal system it seems that um you know at the state level or the federal level you could possibly be running into a number of legal challenges that will either block some form of social housing you know we've got the fair cloth amendment which literally does not allow the federal government to to provision uh, public housing at all and and it's unclear um, whether or not local initiatives would get challenged in the courts if they tried to do their own thing. I mean, you know, there is literally a law on the books in New York State that local municipalities cannot form their own uh, rent laws. Um, and so everything needs to be done uh, in Albany, where there is very little um, interest in doing such a thing, let alone, you know, passing good cause, which would just allow tenants to stay in their homes. Yeah, it. I mean, I don't want to go up to the Supreme Court defending my vision for mass social housing, certainly. Um, it's not unconstitutional. And and like we talked about, there is a history of doing this. So there, there are ways to do it. Um, a lot of it involves paying a lot of money to whoever owns the land and buildings right now, though. And so basically, if you're if the state is going to take property by eminent domain, they have to pay out the fair market value and the, the owner can challenge if they... Uh, lowball them. So, you know, a lot of people look at the vacant luxury condos of a place like Billionaire's Row on West 57th Street in Manhattan and say, well, let's let's take those. Let's move the homeless into those 
uh, vacant units, there's there's enough to house everybody right there. Uh, if we did that, we would have to come up with billions of dollars to pay out all those billionaires to take their property, or else we'll end up in the Supreme Court and we'll lose. So it's not impossible. It, it, it would take not only a great amount of political will, but also a huge political, huge public dollar payout to like the worst people in the world. So that's like the, the situation that the legal system has gotten us in. There is the Faircloth Amendment, which uh, since the 1990s has prevented the federal government from paying for an expansion of public housing. There's a couple of ways around that, though. One is, what if the federal government didn't pay for it? What if the state government did? Um, there are states and counties that have been basically doing that. What sucks about it is it's hard to reach deep affordability with the scale of budgets that states have compared to federal uh, budgets and the ability to print money. So you often end up with less affordable affordable housing for that reason. But it is possible. Um, the other thing is the federal government has privatized so much public housing that there's actually a fair amount of public housing development they could now fund. Right. So all, all the Faircloth Amendment said was you can't have a net increase in public housing. But if you already shrunk your public housing by tens of thousands of apartments, you could now build tens of thousands of apartments. That's the, the irony of uh, public housing privatization over the last 15 or so years. And you're talking specifically about um, efforts in New York City um, over the last 10 years or so, uh, something like RAD? Yeah, so, so RAD uh, is the federal program. New York City has been doing this a little bit. Other cities have done it entirely. So can you talk a little bit about for the listeners what RAD is? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it stands for rental assistance demonstration, uh, which doesn't really mean anything. But it's basically a program where the federal government says to local public housing authorities, you can um, give up management and ownership of these buildings to some other entity. Usually that's a for profit housing developer. Um, and then when that happens, we will give them all sorts of resources. We don't give you the public housing developer. So we'll pay you more per apartment by switching them from what's called Section 9, which is traditional public housing, to Section 8, uh, which is usually vouchers, but can also be for standing buildings. And so basically right there, the federal government is saying uh, we value private ownership more than public ownership. It's the same building, it has the same maintenance cost, but suddenly the federal government is willing to pay more as long as you put the ownership in private hands. Um, sometimes they also open up things like low-income housing tax credits to the owners of those properties, though that's not the case in New York City, um, which is even more public money going to the private developer that is not accessible to the public developer. The private developer even more importantly than everything else, can also uh, take out a mortgage on these buildings like any other landlord could, but public housing authorities can't. So there's all sorts of ways that basically uh, by giving ownership from a public entity to a private entity, suddenly more money becomes available for the exact same buildings. Then the buildings get fixed up, sometimes well, sometimes superficially, but in any case, Theoretically, they can now become much more habitable than they were before. And it looks like the magic of the market when really it's just the fact that the federal government favors private owners more than it favors public owners. Transitioning to the piece again, I wanted to get to your tone and how you wrestle with all of these programs and contradictions and how we implement an expansion of them. Um, having been familiar with your work, this is um, not so much a turn, but an expansion on 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 a on a real sort of nostalgia trap theme here of 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 just sort of not so much throwing your hands up, but really making the reader um, grapple with difficult questions. And I want to quote you here: um, the kind of state that can equitably and efficiently parse out that kind of program, social housing while also competently executing the functions of social housing production and the management is, to say the least, not the, manage, uh, not the kind of state we have today. I often need to remind myself of the difference between the state in the abstract and this state we have today. The state could do all these things we discussed here, seize property from bad landlords, build social housing in the suburbs. This state as we know it today in New York City, New York State, or the United States of America will do none of them. 
And I want to quote another line here just shortly after that is going back to the Red Vienna program, which established this paradigm starting in 1918 was damn close to a revolutionary outcome coming into the existence only after World War I, the fall of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Habsburg monarchy, the rise of socialist movements throughout the continent and around the world, and the country's first ever popular election. It might have been an electoral achievement, but it was an election that looked pretty different than anything New York's next mayoral or gubernatorial races. It was then overthrown by one of the most horrifyingly violent regimes in human history, only to be moderately rebuilt after the Second World War. This is not just the stuff of door knocking and persuasion. On glum days, and let's be honest, that's what most of them for me as of late, it's hard to see how the political repertoire we've developed in New York might lead to the scale of change capable of delivering the mass social housing we need. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so so let me first say for, for uh, listeners who haven't read the piece yet, I am very much for social housing. I am. I think that much is clear. I, and and I dedicate most of my time in my work to fighting for it. I'm just trying to to be realistic about why it's so hard. Um, and I think one frustration that I've had as like uh, when I used to be an organizer professionally, especially then, um, reading left wing uh, writing was that I often found that the answer of why we hadn't already won wasn't ever addressed or was rarely addressed. Like, why are we fighting for the same stuff uh, and not winning? And and I often found that the writing that was pitched toward me as a professional tenant organizer at that time and as a former uh, union worker before that, um, the tone is often, when we fight, we win. If you organize, you will win. If you're not winning, you must not be organizing enough, which just felt like somebody like beating me on the head with the newspaper saying work harder when I was like working really damn hard and not getting paid particularly well and not winning at the scale that was changing all that much. So I had a real craving for writing that was like readable to an everyday audience that actually engaged with the question of why aren't we winning? Why haven't we won? What would have to change in order for us to win? And so that's what I'm trying to do with this piece and with those excerpts that you just read to say, like, we know that the state, the one that's like run by Joe Biden and maybe Donald Trump and Kathy Hochul and Eric Adams is not the same as, you know, the state that we imagine when we think about like a Leninist revolution. It's there and they're not going to behave that way simply because we want them to. So. The question is like, okay, usually where that takes you is um, we have to create a political crisis that they can only resolve by doing what we need. Um, and that usually works for a while, but often the state then sort of corrects once the crisis has ebbed um, and ends up underfunding the program that they created at our demand. Uh, in terms of social housing right now and uh, the state that we have, part of this is about creating, you know, a, uh, a platform that people can run to change the state, right? If you want to run for office, if you want to replace uh, the folks who are absolutely dead set on continuing the failing housing system than we have right now, you're going to need a platform. And you're going to need a platform that uh, people can believe in and that people believe would actually change their lives. And so going through the history of social housing in New York, for me, is partly about showing people we're not making this up whole cloth. We have actually done this before. We just need to do it again and much more of it and do it better and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's easier to imagine a thing that we've done in the past being revived than uh, bringing in whole cloth, a system that looks nothing like the system we have and whose politics are nothing like that. That's what I mean about the the Red Vienna stuff. We should be inspired by Red Vienna, but we can't expect like Maya Wiley to win for mayor of New York City and then suddenly she's doing a Red Vienna in, in New York. It's not gonna not gonna happen. In in that way, I think ironically, you're pointing to a Marxist methodology more so than other self-proclaimed sort of like organizing we will win left style Marxists in that. Um, 
it is taking the idea of, of, of dialectical opposition as it exists in reality very seriously and understanding the historical and material conditions in which you are operating. You know, I, to, I, I don't like to use a lot of this jargon out in, in public or whatever, but it, it really is kind of that simple. And I think the stakes here are important to recognize. And I also want to recognize a lot of the wins. Just a few years ago, thanks to the hard work of, of, or, of housing organizers, um, uh, especially our friends Sia Weaver and State Senator Julia Salazar, um, under Andrew Cuomo, some of the the, the biggest uh, rollbacks to to rent regulations um, were were undermined, and we we got some some big victories there. Um, but now, uh, you know, it, it's at the same time looking at the program a few years later, some of these um, laws are just being flat out ignored. Some landlords are refusing to even register the fact that they have rent regulated apartments under their um under their 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 watch to the state's um authorities um and this government does not have a a lot of incentive to do much about it um how do how do we manage that contradiction which i think the nostalgia trap podcast is is, is often dabbling in this sort of like schizophrenic we have to have some sort of vision but at the same time, we have to recognize how hard things are and, and, and be realistic with ourselves. What do we do with that just emotionally and personally? Yeah. Well, so 2019 was a tremendous legislative victory for the for the tenant movement that was really decades in the making. Um, but the agency that enforces that law took years to just put out their interpretation of it. It's called the regulation. So there's the law and then there's the regulations. The regulations say, how are we actually going to do this law? Some of it is very clear and took effect immediately. Some of it is subject to interpretation. The housing agency is essentially controlled by the government. Um, you could say the same thing about our housing agency at the city level is essentially controlled by the mayor. So this is part of uh, understanding where we're at politically right now. We've built enough power to um, pass some legislation that we could not pass for 30, 40 years. That's tremendous. That is uh, because of uh, both electoral and uh, extra electoral organizing that's been going on in housing, in labor and environmental movements. And we passed some extraordinary bills. So like there's this tenant protection bill from 2019 uh, there is various climate bills that have passed at the city and state level that would have been unthinkable um, just a few years ago. Uh, raising, well, raising the minimum wage, we've been able to enforce a little bit better than some of these others. But anyway, a lot of momentum there legislatively. What we don't have control over is the administrative state. I'm going to sound like Steve Bannon or something, but the administrative state is is undermining <laughs> a lot of these electoral victories. Uh so this, this housing agency takes years to promulgate the regulations that would actually interpret the law. And in the meantime, they allow landlords to do absurd things that flout the law, uh, like not registering it, like you mentioned. One uh, piece that was in the news a bunch is something called Frankenstein, which was when landlords would take two vacant adjacent apartments, combine them into one, call them a new apartment and reset the rent at market level. Just kind of the only way that landlords had left uh, to raise rents dramatically in rent-stabilized apartments. It took the the agency years to say, actually, this is a, in violation of the, the spirit of the law and our regulations will make it so. Um, so what that probably means is we would have to elect different executives if we wanted these executive agencies to behave differently. Uh, and so far, the electoral left has not built up the power to actually win um a mayor or a governor in a city or state like that. i think part of the challenge here is understanding where um moderates and liberals fit into a coalition that helps us get to where we need to be it seems like a very tenuous place right now given um the genuine disagreement among seriously vital questions around construction around gentrification around displacement around the supply question, and especially around social housing. I think part of what, looking at the long lens of history here, um, 
there is a, a, a hostility to social housing in the long view of mm -hmm. a, a, a private construction in that you know, developers were fighting against NYCHA before it was even an idea. And then as it was being implemented, it was being watered down thanks to lobbying efforts, both, you know, political ideology. You had dead in the wool psycho developers who really believed that this was communism in a time where the USSR was a thing. And then you also have um, just expedient, you know, this is going to eat into my profits. I can't let this happen. Um, I think looking at that long view of history, it, it is difficult to build coalitions with nominally well-intentioned and, and, you know, left liberal developmentalists who believe that lots of new construction will get us to where we need to go. I think um, making partners out of developers who, you know, some seem to be ambivalent towards the whole thing, you know, <laughs> you want a little bit of social housing, go for it. But at the same time, we're seeing that they're not even building right now without their their tax breaks around 421A. Um, this is all a, a, a long way of saying um, it seems really, really tenuous to build a coalition of, of moderates and liberals. I don't know how we get there. Um, but, you know, organizations like Housing Justice for All seem to be pointing away and, and organizing around tenants' rights seem to be one of the only ways forward. Yeah. Um, you know, Housing Justice for All, for those who don't know, is a, is a coalition of, I think, about 80 organizations around New York State that's fighting for, for tenants and for homeless New Yorkers. And it does include groups with the pretty wide center to far left uh, political ideology. And it it does so uh, carefully and uh, takes a lot of work to maintain that coalition, but it, it's pretty vital. Uh, and it's proved to be politically potent in part because it includes not just a, a diverse set of ideologies, but a, a geographically diverse um, housing movement and, and multiple types of housing. So one part of that 2019 tenant law that we talked about earlier uh, was about manufactured homes or, or mobile homes. Um, and we were able to identify that some of the same private equity schmucks who are buying out rent stabilized apartments in apartment buildings in New York City were buying up the land that trailers are parked on in upstate New York. And we could get a coalition of um, poor and precarious semi homeowners upstate uh, with downstate renters. That is less about like far left and moderate seeing eye to eye and more about different types of people seeing that they were being screwed over by the same entities and that some of the same legislative solutions could apply. Um, so maybe there's something there to build on. There's also the success and popularity of some of those older social housing models. So public housing is almost uniquely and psychotically hated in America um, to the point that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. People uh, hate it and then allow it to be uh, demolished or run down or privatized or whatever. And then they say that's because it was public housing in the first place. And that re, re uh, solidifies people's bias against public housing. But there is a lot of support for a lot of the other kinds of social housing that exists. And a lot of people recognize that the main problem with it is that it wasn't all permanent. So uh, Mitchell Lama housing is extremely popular in New York City and New York State. That stuff that was built in the mid 20th century through a state subsidized program, created these uh, limited equity cooperatives and subsidized rentals. There's a long waiting list to get into those. Uh, everybody who lives in the co-ops especially um, recognizes that, you know, what they paid for those apartments is like maybe one twentieth of the market rate in a lot of New York City right now. Uh, and they're high quality housing. So like, if you get people to associate social housing with the things that they already know and like, but think there isn't enough of, then there might be a way to uh, get them on board with a program that they might otherwise, in the abstract, not support. So, Sam, looking forward, what are some of the practical proposals out there uh, around social housing and otherwise? So focusing on New York State, because that's what I wrote about in uh, in this piece and that's what I know the best. 
Um, we've got a few different proposals that are in formation. Some already exist in legislation. Others are being written up right now. Um, they go in a couple different directions, which could be complementary or could happen independently of one another. Um, on the conversion side, converting already existing housing, what I would call antisocial housing into social housing, uh, there's a few mechanisms on the table, but maybe one of the most um, most viable and one that actually tenants are fighting for in a number of cities and states around the country is called TOPA or Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act. Um, there are also similar bills called COPA, Community Opportunity to Purchase Act or City Opportunity to Purchase Act. Basically what these do is create um, a point of intervention where one doesn't exist right now. So in the, the converted social housing that I live in, the point of intervention was landlords stop paying their property taxes. And so that is a problem that the city could remedy by taking possession of the buildings and then turning them over to the tenants under this long-term uh, social housing contract. We don't have that opportunity so much in high rent cities anymore because landlords are holding on to every building they can or just flipping them to some other landlord for profit. So how could we get that intervention again? Uh, well, with a, a bill like these Opportunity to Purchase Acts, every time a rental building is sold, the tenants or the city have an opportunity to buy out the land. Um, the city of Washington, D.C. has had this since the 1970s. Um, San Francisco did this a couple of years ago. Um, and it can be very effective at two things. One is actually producing limited equity cooperatives, uh, tenant controlled social housing and housing that was landlord controlled before. Um, and it can give tenants a tremendous amount more power than they had before. The landlord now can't just sell the building from under them uh, when they're organizing. They can't flip it to some uh, separate LLC, limited liability corporation that they also control and revoke on whatever promises the, the landlord had made previously. Now they always have to go through the tenants, uh, which can create a lot of bargaining. power. So that's maybe the most viable model that's out there for these conversions. You create a law that says whenever the building is going to sell, the tenants or the city have an opportunity to say, we want to buy this or we want the city to buy it or we want to name a nonprofit to buy it or whatever the, the tenants want. And then you have public money available to do it as long as they abide by these social housing guidelines of decommodification, resident control, social equality. That's conversion. Uh, then you've got this question of construction. How are we going to build new social housing? How are we going to actually do the supply side solution that the market doesn't do very well, uh, even when zoning has been reformed? So this probably looks like the creation of something called the Social Housing Development Authority which would be a new ent public entity that exists solely for the purpose of building social housing. It could uh, initiate its own bond financing. It could override local zoning. It can do all these things that state authorities are empowered to do that local governments can't and that uh, the existing housing agencies won't. Um, a social housing development authority could be really prescriptive and it could say, you're gonna build housing for this mix of people, people making this much money to that much money. Uh, it should go here, 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 and here. Or it can be more general and just say, the Social Housing Development Authority is gonna build social housing. What that looks like in you know a poor Rust Belt city is gonna look different than what that looks like in Midtown Manhattan. And it's gonna have the flexibility uh, to do either. The Social Housing Development Authority could also be the purchaser of all those tenant opportunity to purchase buildings if the tenants want. The tenants say, we don't necessarily have the, the, the wherewithal to run this building, but we want the Social Housing Development Authority to buy this and to run it as social housing. Uh, there will be an entity that's there and capitalized and ready to do that. So those are the kind of two models that are on the table. Um, they're totally compatible, but they could also happen independently of one another if the politics, you know, allows for one but not the other. Sam, you you've undermined yourself in that you provide a way forward. <laughs> <laughs>
even when you uh, when you leave your readers a little hopeless. Vote Stein twenty twenty four. Don't uh, don't 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 <laughs> don't don't tempt me with a good time. Sam, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Drew. Well, okay, my friends, I think that's going to do it for Nostalgia Trap slash Housing Trap this week. I want to thank Sam and Andrew for having a really great conversation that I learned a lot from. I hope you did, too. There are lots of links in the episode description, including the New York Review of Architecture piece that Sam and Andrew are talking about this week, um, and uh, uh, our Patreon page, which has all of the Housing Trap episodes collected if you want to go down the rabbit hole with Andrew into the New York housing world, there's a lot of fun stuff there. So go check that out. We appreciate it. Hope you have a great week. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.